Now, the first of our special interviews, we start now. And a man who has been a great supporter of Peace One Day over the years, Paul Pullman, is co-founder and chair of Imagine, an organization helping businesses meet the UN global goals for sustainable development. Talking to him, a brilliant British screen actor, fresh from shooting Francis O'Connor's feature film, Emily, and whose TV credits include some of the biggest dramas on British television, The Driver, My Mad Fat Diary, Safe House, Mr. Selfridge, and The Mill. Folks, please welcome Sasha Parkinson and Paul Pullman. Hello, and welcome to Action Live. I'm so thrilled to be here, and today I have the great pleasure and privilege of interviewing co-founder and chair of Imagine, Mr. Paul Pullman. Hi, Paul. How are you? Hey, Sach, How are you doing? I'm good really you. good, thank you. <laughs> so, I'm going to go straight to it. I'm going to ask, when did your passion begin for making a real impact through business in terms of sustainability and climate action? Well, so that's, uh, thanks for asking that. In fact, during my entire career, I always saw the power of business as being a force for good. I always believed that business could not succeed in failing societies, but I also firmly believe that it couldn't be a bystander in a system that gives them life in the first place. I think the pandemic, the tragic pandemic we are going through, in uh, once more in no subtle way, has reminded us of the values of cooperation with both the planet and other fellow human beings. I grew up in the 60s and many of the values that I got, thankfully, were from my parents. Values of dignity and respect for everybody, uh, equity, compassion, they were very important for them. They very much believed in us having a better life, in peace in Europe, in, in education, etc. They truly put themselves to the service of others. And then I really grew up in the 70s, if you want to, where we had the first time um, the uh, Earth Day was in 1970. We had the Rio conference a little bit later in 1992. And I really got into it in a serious way. We met in Rio Plus 20 in 2012, when we were uh, celebrating the great progress we had made on the Millennial Development Goals. And some of the people were proposing to establish what is the Sustainable Development Goals or what people now uh, called the global goals. I was honored to be asked at that time by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to form part of a panel of 27, uh, what he called imminent people, to develop these goals with a simple objective to irreversibly eradicate poverty and doing that in a more sustainable and equitable way. And I, listening to all the people all across the world, I saw the power of these goals not only to make this world function for all, but also the enormous business opportunities that were uh, underpinning this. It only takes uh, three to five trillion dollars a year to implement these goals. But as you know, the government's overseas development aid is only 160 billion. So in order to make it come alive, it needs business, it's innovations, it's financing, it's people and it's resources. And this is really what I've been focused on since. Wow. Well, many companies are working toward being you know, less bad and reducing the impacts that they create, but your vision of the future is one of net positive. And so can you, can you tell us a little bit about this? Because I understand that this is also the subject of your new book. Is that right? Yeah, that's totally right. And, and uh, it's a good thing that you start with less bad. When things are bad, <laughs> we're already well beyond the planetary boundaries, less bad isn't simply good enough anymore. So uh, being that positive is about a movement that describes how successful companies can profit, not from creating the world's problems, but from actually solving the world's problems. For, for business to be successful long term, they need to show, I believe, that they have a net positive impact, or in other words, make this a better world for all. If business cannot show that they have this net positive impact on society, then why should we as citizens of this world allow them to be around? And increasingly, we are making our voices heard and leveraging our spending powers or making our votes count. It requires a more complete definition of performance for business, a more comprehensive process of what you might call value creation that goes beyond the financial returns alone. You know, last year in 2020, 
Earth Overshoot Day was August 22nd. That is actually the day that the world uses up all its resources that it can replenish, which means in simple terms that after that day, we're actually stealing from future generations. So I don't want to be part of that. We've seen in the last few uh, uh, decades about 68% of our mammals, fish, birds, reptiles disappear. We've cut down half of the world's rainforests. We're keeping people in poverty, 4.2 billion people on less than $5 a day. So if we don't find a way to live in harmony with fellow citizens and with the planet, we're not going to make that. Now, the good thing is that we have these sustainable development goals that we talked about, which is an enormous business plan. Just in the next 10 years, we estimate that it could unlock up to $12 trillion of economic value, create 380 million jobs. So businesses that are taking this holistic approach, want to be part of that solution, actually are uh, better placed and I think more successful. So that's why I wrote the book. It's coming out in October by Harvard Press. It's called Net Positive, Why Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. And it talks about what net positive companies have to do. In very simple terms, to keep it very short, a net positive company has to take ownership of all its impacts and consequences, intended or not, in this world. It has to operate for the long-term benefit of business and society. It has to create positive return for all of its stakeholders. It drives shareholder return as a result of what it does, not its objective. And last but not least, it has to be part of these broader transformations that society uh, is looking for. So you can order the book and get on the way. It's available already for pre-orders, if I may say. There's no excuse for anyone if that book exists. No excuse. So what is courage to you? Because you often speak about courageous leadership. And so what, what are the hallmarks of courageous leadership? And what does that mean today in a COVID you know, climate stressed world? Yeah, I think we have a deficit of courageous leaders. It, it often is said that we already have the means and the resources to tackle our two biggest challenges, which I might call climate change and inequality. We've be never been so forewarned about what is going to happen, but we also have never been so forearmed with actually tools already to do something about it. But too often we hear the business leaders, the politicians, betting on new technologies or innovations for a greener or fairer economy or setting objectives basically too low. In reality, we know what we need to do, as I said, and we have all the tools. We know how to build toilets for people, how to build housing, how to make food without cutting down the forests, how to provide green and efficient energy, how to implement circular models. Yet still today, I believe too many are still playing not to lose versus playing to win with minimal commitments that they can get away with, small targets that they can achieve versus the bold targets that are needed to solve these worldly problems. So it takes courage to do the harder right versus the easier wrong. It takes courage to set targets that you know are needed, but you don't have yet all the answers of how to achieve it. It takes courage to work with others and form these broader partnerships to solve these bigger issues. So the word courage, to be honest, Sacha, comes from the French word cur, which actually means heart. Good leadership is both with the head and the heart. These people step out of the PR or the smaller commitments and put a human face on what matters. They operate with a high level of empathy, compassion, humanity, humility, all the traits that courageous leaders possess. So that is why I believe to solve today's problems, we need to put humanity back in the middle of all we do. And for that reason, we need these courageous leaders. Absolutely. And so finally, the core message of today's event is no climate action, no peace. What is the role of individuals and what impacts can they make? So do you, do you have faith that we can turn this around? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. We all can make a big difference, not even a small difference anymore, Sajja. Runaway, runaway climate change is absolutely the biggest existential threat that we're facing as humanity. We're moving in the right direction, but we're still missing the skill and speed with which we're moving. 
many people still think that it is possible to stay below the one and a half degrees. And as we talked, when we talked courageous leaders, it requires above all willpower. The International Energy Agency or the Energy Transition Task Force or the UN have done many studies that shows by all means, although it's hard work, that we can still stay below the one and a half degrees. And frankly, it is at a significantly lower cost to avoid climate change than the enormous cost that we would incur if we let this get out of hand. COVID is a direct result of destroying biodiversity, the zoonotic diseases. It has cost us already $25 trillion to the global economy. So we're at a point, frankly, that the cost of not acting is starting to become higher than the cost of acting. I'm actually a climate optimist, or I would call it a prisoner of hope. And I believe that this year could actually be a super year for not only making the commitments to solve this, but also to putting firm actions behind it. We have the COP15 on biodiversity in Kunming. We have the COP26 in Glasgow as two of the uh, most important events. And momentum is building. We've never seen in the last year, despite COVID, so many ambitious climate actions to decarbonize our global economy. Because people understand from Joe Biden to the Prime Minister of Japan, if you want to, that it creates jobs, that it provides for more inclusion. So your generation, if I may call it the youth, give me definitely a hope of, uh, for the future. In, in time-honored tradition, I think the youth has often been the ones that redesign the future in their own image, but simultaneously creating a better world for everybody. Over half the world population is now below 30 years old. And the interesting thing is you're going to be 100% tomorrow. You have more energy, creativity, passion, and self-belief. You embrace technology, accept uncertainty. Most of the conditions and, and solutions that I've seen in the world are actually coming from these younger people. More purpose-driven, tolerant, open, and more accountable, actually, than any generation before them. So I think that the young are going to make a big difference. It's important not only to give them a seat at the table as we work these plans, but increasingly, I believe that we actually have to give them the table. I love that. Well, on behalf of myself and the entire world, and especially the next generation to follow, I want to thank you for everything you've done and continue to do, because we're extremely lucky to have someone like you fighting in our corner. So thank you so much for allowing me to interview you today, Paul. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Satya, and an honor. And likewise, lots of admiration for what you're doing. Be safe.